Anyway, now we have found ourselves near the completion of our lecture series with our final lecture, which really is, is going to be just about talking through what we've learned over the last little bit here. What it's really going to be looking to do is what really is the way forward? How do we take the advantages of the cyclical sanctification method and the progressive sanctification method and find a way to sort of create a hybrid method, a, a third way, a holistic way of sanctification, a holistic way of practicing personal holiness. At least that is what I have in mind, so I hope that's in line with uh, what uh, uh, Oz here has in mind. Otherwise, then we're, then we're in trouble if we've got uh, some different ideas here. But basically, the hope, ultimately, of this is that this rudimentary model, which in no way is going to be perfect, will provide inspiration for your spiritual journey of sanctification, and it will encourage that cultivation of personal holiness that is so important to the Christian life. Because, of course, as uh, Oz was so clear about in his lecture, the scriptures aren't just about knowing. Knowing is important, of course, but knowing doesn't help you very much unless we put into action what we know. And so that's really the hope with this, to take what we know and to put it into action. So, any opening thoughts there, Oz? No, that sounds good. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we'll start back again at cyclical sanctification and we'll remind ourselves what is one of the attributes that is so valuable about cyclical sanctification. And that is it always takes you back to the cross again and again and again. The justification by faith alone is the center of the cyclical sanctification method. Without justification, there is no sanctification. Without justification, there is no glorification. And so it always brings us back to Christ's atoning work on the cross. It brings us back to that one central historical event of Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. That is what the cyclical sanctification model is always doing for us. It's a model, as Oz was pointing out, that allows us to realize that even when we fail, God hasn't abandoned us. God is still working out the things that we need to transform, the things that need to be changed in our lives, the things that we need to stop doing, and the things that we need to start doing. God is always at work at that. And even when we fail, we can always go back to the cross because Jesus' mercy, the mercy of God himself, always outpaces our sin. Now, of course, as Paul says, that is no excuse to go on sinning that grace may increase. By no means, says Paul. But what it does mean is there is hope for sinners like you and me. There is hope that when we don't do things right, when we didn't do things the way we ought to do them, when we weren't what we were supposed to be, when we didn't do what we were supposed to do, that there's hope for a tomorrow. There's hope and a future for us. And that, I think, is the lesson to be taken from cyclical sanctification, that we get that daily dying and rising in Christ. And moreover, I think especially, and this is the beautiful part of cyclical sanctification, is it grounds us firmly in our baptism as well. It reminds us that this isn't just a one and done event. The dip and then dip, <laughs> right? It's, it is more than that. The person that goes in here is not the same that comes out. And we have that opportunity and that calling to live in the baptismal grace that God has given us. In this newness of life, to live in Christ. And so... In my mind, that's what cyclical sanctification brings to the table in this conversation. Any thoughts about that before we move on and perhaps look at some of the ways progressive sanctification brings something to the table as well? well I'd like to add 
to that just on two points. The first is, and this is, you know, this is important in my own life, that cyclical sanctification undercuts the logic and the, and the, the energy behind a despair or a discouragement around my own abilities or my own <laughs> track record. Um, and so it, when we understand this process of justification by faith alone, we get rid of any basis to evaluate and assess ourselves to take our own pulse, as it were. Um, because the, the critical piece is not how well I'm doing, but what God has done and what God has decided for me. And so I like to think about justification as, you know, it produces righteousness for us. And this idea of righteousness, I find most helpful to think about right standing, and the right standing is in the family of God. So righteousness gives us a right standing in God's people, in His family, which means that we belong. And so for me, the uh, cyclical sanctification, because it grounds me in justification, reminds me that that, my citizenship, sorry, the fact that I'm God's ch mm -hmm. child is never up for debate mm -hmm. or dispute. Mm -hmm. I like to use this analogy or this comparison. Um, well, if you had a child when you were raising kids who, you know, one day came to you in tears and, and broken hearted and said, I don't think I, I don't think I can be your child anymore, mommy or daddy, because look at these bad things I did. You know, like I was mean to Billy, my brother, or whatever. Your heart would just break. You'd be like, oh my goodness, how do you go there from doing something bad to say that you can't be my child? You know I love you. And you would just, rarely I think would a child do that, but sometimes children do get very uh, inord inordinately uh, concerned about their own culpability, right? Like their own ability to, to be bad. And, and I think we, sh we need to remind ourselves that we always belong to God. There's nothing that will ever change that. Which is what you would say to your child. You're always mine. I'll always love you. There's nothing that will change that. Uh, and getting that settled gets rid of all sorts of craziness in the Christian journey. All sorts of trying to jump through hoops, trying to perform, trying to create experiences, trying to get more of this or more of that. Settling that question. So that's what I think cyclical mm -hmm. sanctification does. And I might be wrong here, but I've been told that that Luther, when Satan would really just be working him over, he would say, I'm baptized. And he would just say, I'm God's. God chose me. I had nothing to do with that. I'm born here. I rightfully belong. I'm at home. And so, mm. anyhow, to me, that's a tremendous gift. Absolutely. No, and, and I think especially in a time where identity is such a pressing topic, as we know very well, and people are obsessed with these ideas and identities, I think it's very important as Christians that we ground ourselves in that true identity, our identity in Christ, and that that identity can't be ripped away. It's not something so fragile that if I wake up tomorrow and I, you know, I just wasn't a good guy last night. Ah, I guess I'm not a child of God anymore, as Oz was saying. To really live into that identity, to really be a citizen of heaven whose citizenship cannot be revoked. You cannot lose citizenship to the country that you were born in. They're not going to strip you of your citizenship in Canada here or wherever you might have been born. They're, they're not going to take it away. They can't. And so when we are born again as children of the Heavenly Father, that citizenship in heaven cannot be taken away. That cannot be taken from us. And that is an important thing to remember as we go through the ups and downs of lives, as we, go, as we progress, as we go backwards, and everything in between that comes in life. Yeah, that's a very valuable thing. So what do you think are the key lessons for, from progressive sanctification, Oz? Well, there's a couple things, but I think as I ended um, the talk this morning, um, what we think is, is the critical piece because it, it identifies where we're stumbling, where our bad habits of thought are. And so Romans 12, familiar passage for most of us, Romans 12, 1. And this is Paul getting into the how then should we live after he's given all the 
this theological teaching. I urge you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the progressive sanctification, presenting ourselves as living sacrifices on the altar. And do not be conformed to this age or this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And mind here is bigger than just the brain. It has to do with attitudes of the heart, which is probably more important than just what we think. But it contains uh, elements of both. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Um, so in my own life, Roland, when I was a young man and, and like just inescapably on this roller coaster of up, down, and there, no, no, no real stability, mm -hmm. especially if emotionally I wasn't feeling good about myself or the world or the people I was hanging out with, I would be just like, you know, I was jerked around by the, my environment, my circumstances, and, uh, and I remember, a, you know, a younger couple, they were uh, my seniors in the faith and, and a little older than me at the school I was at. But they pointed me to Romans 8, which says, the one who walks according to the flesh has their mind set on the things of the flesh. Mm -hmm. The one who walks according to the spirit has their mind set on the things of the spirit. And it was this, um, this remind or this realization that I had a choice I could make. That's the key. Um, I'm choosing to be helpless when I let my circumstances and my surroundings overwhelm me. I've focused on either what's important on a fleshly or human level, or I've focused on what I want from my human and, and um, my human perspective or my human desires and wants. And I haven't set myself on, I haven't set my mind and my attitudes and my values on what is important. God. But when I choose to do that, then I experience some freedom. I didn't experience a brand, like a sort of revolutionary escape from everything. But what, what happened is that sense of being swallowed and overwhelmed mm -hmm. disappeared. And I was able to step forward to make incremental growth. Uh, and so for me, the key thing about progressive sanctification is not the logic. I think we all can recognize the value and the importance of growing, the key thing for me is overcoming the frustration and the seeming impossibility, which we heard from mm -hmm. Romans 7, that the very thing I want to do is the thing I don't do, yeah. the thing I've said I'm not going to do, I end up doing. Uh, that very real reality gives the lie to progressive sanctification. It tells us it's impossible. Uh, but then Paul goes on in Romans 8 to tell us how we can make the choice. So there's two things from that. One is that the thing I like about Christianity um, as sort of, as an apologetic, that is if I'm talking to non-Christians, is psychology and, and various other things can tell us how helpless we are and give us an excuse for why we're so helpless, pointing to, you know, mm -hmm. factors of home and environment, etc., etc. But Christianity restores to us the dignity freedom of making a choice. And so we can choose today who our master will be. We can't choose not to have a master, as Bob Dylan told us. You're going to have to serve somebody. Uh, but we can choose who we're going to serve. And so the very practical, pragmatic application of that truth in our life by the choice of what we're going to focus on it is liberating and it restores our dignity as humans I think it has the potential to revolutionize our Christian journey, not typically as kind of a radical transformation, but as a day-by-day -day mm -hmm. faithfulness. So God has taken away, in progressive sanctification, he's taken away the mystery about what holiness and growth looks like by telling us to pay attention to what we've set our sights on. Mm. If you're aiming for the things of God and the Spirit of God, then you're going to live a life that bears that out. If, you, if you're aiming at your own human desires and your own 
values and wants. And this is hard for us because sometimes uh, these things are very good things. If you're a parent, you want good things for your children. But when you begin to focus on that, you've tied yourself to a human possibility. Yeah. So our children or our churches or our ministry mm -hmm. or our spouses always have to be a value to us in the context of our eyes being set on the things of the Spirit. Usually those two coincide because our children are also very near and dear to God's heart, mm -hmm. etc. But anyhow, that, that I think is, is the key thing. Mind on the flesh leads to living out the fleshly realities. Mind on the Spirit begins to empower us and transform us into living a life that's approving to God through the power of the Holy Spirit, that is, living out of the righteousness we've received mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I mean, that's undeniably something very valuable. I mean, of course, one of the concerns always with progressive sanctification when misunderstood is some people try to always look for the measuring cues. Am I better than tomorrow? And you know, I used to talk with some of my friends and, and they would almost complain, well, I'm not a saint yet. I'm not a saint yet. Well, no, you're not. But you're better than you were yesterday. And there's something to be said about that because progressive sanctification was something I really needed in my life, this concept to wake me up because I was in a total spiritual slumber. I was happily in the cyclical sanctification method. Here we go, round and round and round we go. Nothing changed. I still had various aspects of my life that remained uncaptive to Christ, really, is the only way I can describe it. I would spend hours and hours and hours playing video games in a week when I was a teenager, 40, 60, 80 hours a week. Terrible addiction I had to it. I loved to pick fights over every little thing that I could just because I liked to debate. And so even the most minor possible disagreement, I would find a way to fight over it. Or even if someone worded something just slightly wrong, I'd be like, gotcha, and go right into it. And so that was a very uh, sort of toxic mindset. And these things hadn't been captive to Christ. These things hadn't changed. Even though I said I believed, even though I knew Christ and knew what he did for me, nothing was changing really in my personal life. You couldn't really tell the difference between Roland the Christian and Roland just the person. And that was a problem because I was reading in scriptures these things that say, well, be in the world, but not of the world. You will be persecuted. You will have these sorts of differentiating characteristics about you that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was just going to do. And one time, and, and something that really slapped me in the face is I was at this sort of retreat one time, and I was talking about you know, how I like to do a certain thing, and it's like, well, I just can't change because that's just who I am. And the person simply said to me, why not? And it was such a simple question. And yet it struck me right to the soul. Why not? Because you know what? I didn't really have a good answer. Because, and as this woman went on to say, you're essentially saying God can't change you. Oh, well now I was in trouble. Because I knew very well I couldn't say that. So what I knew and what I experienced now hit head to head. I can't say that God can't change me because that would make God not God. So you know what that meant for me, right? Uh-oh. I need to change. Or at least I need to try to start changing. And so that was the wake-up call that I needed. I needed this idea that actually, yes, I can be better tomorrow than I was today. I can walk in the right direction by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Word, by the power of the sacraments. I can remove habits. I can add habits that are good. 
that any of this is even a possibility. That was revolutionary to the way that I lived my life. And it seems so simple. People look at me and say, well, how did you not know that? And yet I didn't. It was an utter revelation to me. Wow, I can actually do something. This can actually change. Why? Not because I'm strong enough, but because I have a God who can do all things. And that God has given me his Holy Spirit to help me, to guide me, to form me, to shape me, to sanctify me, to make me holy as he is holy. And so I think that is what I take away from progressive sanctification. Yes, you can do better. And yes, you're called to do better. And yes, you should do better. And I would even go so far as saying other people should see that you're doing better too. Maybe not right away. Maybe it's the subtle things. But I would hope that in three months when I see someone that I haven't seen again, that they would say, Roland, you're better than you were three months ago. I would really hope that. And I think if we have our mind on the things of Christ, that's inevitable. Because we'll be pursuing the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh. And how, my friends, can we not be transformed when we are pursuing the things of the Spirit? If God is dwelling in us, if we are engaging in God in that way through the Spirit, how can we not be transformed? So that's what I think on, on that. Yeah, and so I think, Roland, again, because of my own experience, I think realizing that you can change means that you've made a choice not to change. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it reminds us again that we have a choice to make. It's not, that, it, it's not that mysterious. It is mysterious in that we rely on God's spirit, but it's not mysterious as in, well, how the heck, you know, what's actually going on? The fact is that we make a choice, to pursue one path or another and that God and Jesus Christ has given us that freedom to make the choice even when that choice seems terribly, terribly difficult. Yeah, and so I think uh, at, at the end of my talk in our uh, discussion period I ended up by talking about love and to me that's how we reconcile mm -hmm. these differences because first of all there's uh, St. John in, in 1 John and, and 1 John is a great book to read on the whole concept of love and the freedom of Christ and the ability to live a, a sanctified, a holy life uh, as we heard in the reading this morning in our, our service of the word but the love motivation John gets to when he reminds us that this is love, not that we love God but that he first loved us person marked by love lives a different life. They live a life that's free from fear of God, because perfect love casts out fear. They live a life that's free from the fear of judgment, because love leads us to live a life that gives us a confidence before God, in particular a life of love with one another. So I want to just talk a little bit about love as a way to kind of bring these two components together. At the end of our uh, worksheet that you have in that reading from 2 Peter, chapter 1, Peter, after he's listed this way that we can grow, enter into the promises of God, adding, you know, uh, to our faith, self-discipline, and, and all sorts of things, he says, if these qualities are yours, they make you fruitful in the knowledge of God. He says, if anyone lacks these qualities, they are short-sighted, and they have forgotten that they were purified from their former sins. And so, for me, the key to this, bringing these together and avoiding the excesses of either, uh, and we know that either, either approach to sanctification can lead to some excesses, the key is the motivation of love that comes as I recognize again the great love of God manifested in forgiving me my sins. So Luke, in uh, chapter 7, Jesus encounters a sinful woman who's weeping over his feet, uh, washing them with her tears, wiping them with her hair, and the Pharisee is scandalized because this is a woman of ill repute. 
touching a holy man. And Jesus says to the, among other things, he says to this Pharisee, he says, you see this woman, her sins being many are forgiven and she loves much. The one who's been forgiven much loves much. And this is a work that only God can do in your heart and spirit to help you understand how much you have been forgiven. But when that happens, and that requires sometimes like some honest dialogue with God, some honest dialogue with yourself. But when that happens, I think we've hit the, the target where our motivation is now going to keep us safe from excesses in either of these. And it incorporates both of these models because it begins with this idea that I'm a sinner, yet God has justified me. This mm -hmm. is cyclical sanctification. So love, when its motivation is... Uh, gets rid of any question about am I proving this or earning it. Love never asks or never seeks to earn or prove themselves. Love always gives with a generosity of heart and spirit and doesn't have secondary motives like if I'm really loving, perhaps you'll let me spend money on something that I want to spend money on. I'm talking about husbands and wives here, right? Uh, if I'm really nice to you, then maybe I can excuse the expenditure that I want to make. Um, so, Augustine tells us that we can love God and do as we will, and then he goes on to qualify that by saying, for the, the beloved, the, the lover will never do anything that's contrary to the desire of the beloved. And so this isn't, a, this isn't a, a license for excess, this is an invitation into recognizing that it genuine motivation of love is going to create in us those attitudes and behaviors that are pleasing to God, if God is the one that we love. Conversely, uh, I think most of us know enough psychology to know that when love is absent, there are tremendous problems and issues in people's lives. If you get a child who has been, you know, birthed into and raised in their formation years in a hostile, unloving environment, Almost, without exception, you've got a deviant, you know, you've got a child that's going to run amok. It's not, you're not getting a healthy, productive member of society here. You're getting someone who's going to be on the outs, you know, on the fringes, who's going to be in and out of prison or in and out of addictions or whatever the case may be. I think that's a fairly safe claim to make. So, so too, with you and I, if, if love is not the formative element, the main theme of our relationship to God, then we, we are dealing with a deficit that's going to manifest itself in aberrant behaviors as far as Christians go. One of those aberrant behaviors would be the lack of fruitfulness, uh -huh. the lack of growth, uh -huh. the lack of sanctification. So, so love would be my answer to this, Roland, how we would reconcile these different sanctification models and how we would what, how would we approach scripture and bring these different scripture yeah. passages together? It's through the lens of love. John tells us God is love. The one who loves knows God and is born of God. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that is probably the way to, to unite these pathways. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, as St. Augustine says in his discourse on the Psalms, love but take care what it is you love. And what he's talking about there is ordering our love correctly. Of course, what are we supposed to love above all? God. Love God, love our neighbors. So we have to order our love in such a way that God is always our highest love, our chief end. And if that's the case, then we can't help but move forward because as Oz was saying if we love someone what do we want to do we want to be our best for that someone we want to interact with them in a way that is healthy that is fruitful that is blessed that is mutually enjoyable that is not bringing shame that is not bringing harm that is not bringing destruction and so in many ways love really is the answer to this question of, of reconciling these different models, the cyclical model with the progressive model. And, and what I would like to propose more than anything else is my understanding of how sanctification works 
is basically, it's still a circle, but the circle goes up and the circle goes down, the circle goes forward and the circle goes back. And what I mean by that is there's movement. The day-to-day -day life is still a dying and rising in Christ. But that being said, that circle moves. And so I think that incorporates the idea that, yes, tomorrow can be better than today, while still having that constant reminder that I am dead in Christ and I am alive in Christ. And that's a beautiful thing. And so that's what I have in my mind, is this circle that moves. Not a circle that stays stagnant, not a circle that stays in one place, but a circle that truly and genuinely moves around. And so I think what it comes down to is, especially when we're talking about something like personal holiness, what it ultimately looks like, and of course the goal of sanctified living is to become righteous and pure and holy, not through our own work, but through the effort of the Holy Spirit working in us, through our obedience to the call of the Spirit to say, I am going to forego this because I love you, Lord. And you do not love this. In fact, you say this is harmful to me. And so even though I, I might enjoy this, even though I might think that this is really great, I love you enough. I love you more than I love this. And this is so often what forms the basis of things like AA. Well, why do so many people come to AA? Because they know that the alcohol, the drugs, has affected their life. It's broken their relationships oftentimes. And they say enough is enough with that. And I think in many ways, AA is the perfect embodiment of both cyclical sanctification and progressive. Because there are times when you're in a rehab program where you fall right back down. That happens a lot. With drugs, with alcohol, with porn, with gambling, with whatever. You name your addiction. But there are also so many stories and so many testimonies where people come in and say, I've been sober for five years. I've been sober for 10 years. I've been sober for 20 years. Well, you know what that means? That means they haven't been drinking. You know what that means? There's been a real change in the person. That the person that was 20 years ago is not the person that is today. And what motivates that more often than not? I would say 99.9% .9 of the times, love. Love motivates that. The love of God, the love of others, and even to an extent, the desire and ability to love yourself. Because when we're, when we're feeling broken, when we're feeling down, when we're feeling hurt, when we're feeling alone and isolated, it's not very easy to say, well, I love me. That's not very easy at all. And why should I love me at all? Not because anything is particularly good at me, but because God loves me. My identity allows me to say, Roland has worth. So I think that the AA has another way in which the cyclical sanctification mm -hmm. is primary because every meeting, as I understand, mm -hmm. of love because we know we can't earn love but if you're anything like me so 25 years ago or whatever I could have said that with a lot of conviction hi I'm Oz I'm a sinner and you all would say welcome Oz because when your turn comes you go hi I'm so and so I'm a sinner too but then after good years of clean living and becoming righteous and you know getting my act together and this that and the other thing 
I think I got a little confused about why I was righteous or where my righteousness came from. Mm -hmm. And I was a little less welcoming to the sinners. Like, oh, come on, get your act together would be part of what I would think. So if I truly come on a cyclical sanctification and I say God loves me, after I've said I'm a sinner, I know that I have not earned that love. And that love has always been freely given that my response is always a genuine response of love. And so for me, the key in all this is remembering that we love God not because we love God, but because He first loved us and He gave His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Again, this is First John. Mm -hmm. We love because God first loved us. So if there's, and I counsel people and I counsel myself, I don't take my own advice. I hope you guys take my advice more than I take my own advice. But I, I counsel people, when you're struggling in this, get back to that primary thing. God, do you love me? How much do you love me? And how can I receive and be open to that love? That's at least part of the solution to any, any struggle in the Christian life, I would think. Well, and this is why there's a sense in which we never really move past the fundamentals, right? It's not to say that, you know, there is no maturing as a Christian but it always comes back to the basics. Who is Christ? Well, Christ is my savior. What did he do? Well, he died for me. What does that mean? I have forgiveness of sins. And it always comes back to that again and again and again. It doesn't matter if you are the most new believer of all to the most experienced believer of all and you're this close from the sainthood, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter because ultimately it always comes back to that. And I think there's so much truth and profound insight. And, and this is why it's very interesting, but uh, Lutherans used to be better at this, but we always reinforced reading and memorizing and learning the small catechism again and again and again. Well, why would we do that? Why would we obsess over learning this book? Because in it contains the very basics of our faith. Who is God? What has he done for us? What are the gifts that God gives us? It's all in, in there. It's all described and explained. And so the idea is that even as you grow, even as you move on through life, you're staying grounded in the core truth that is the foundation of your faith. And I think that's the important thing to remember in sanctification is, is we grow, but we don't grow past what is the foundation. We don't go beyond. Yeah. Yeah, and I think is that they say this every week because they know that if they forget that, they're going to reoffend. Mm -hmm. That's the weird thing about this. As soon as you start to rely on yourself, you're susceptible mm -hmm. to reoffending. Now that's may, maybe not true in everything, but for sure when there's an addictive or something that's a habit that you're struggling against, a pattern of thought or a pattern of, of action, as soon as I begin to rely on myself, a sitting duck, you know, the, the Proverbs tell us before pride, before a fall comes pride, pride cometh before a fall, I remember memorizing that as a little kid, I was going to prove it wrong, but in fact I proved it right every time, you know, uh, so, so I think that's a key again for the cyclical sanctification, when we want to subvert or avoid that unpleasant truth, both sinner and justified by the mercy and grace of God alone. And rely on ourselves. We've set ourselves up to reoffend. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. almost a hundred percent foregone conclusion. Yeah. Well, and this is always what happens because, of course, and even Paul talks about this phenomenon when he talks about the the super apostles, right? And he talks about these people that just think, "Well, I'm just so holy. I'm so sanctified. I'm so great." And and what what happens is, if we're not careful, is we can become a new club of Pharisees and think that we are just these, these wonderful people and I have cultivated this righteousness. I'm just so great. But that always ends in a shipwreck every single time because who did Jesus reserve his harshest criticism for? The self-righteous crowd, the Pharisees. That even, he was even harsher to them than he was to the, the Sadducees, which were the kind of sellout to the Romans. Which is interesting. 
He was more concerned about the people that were patting themselves on the back for being so holy than he was the people that were literally selling out articles of the faith to appease Rome. And I think there's a lesson there. I'm not sure what it is, but I think there's something to be said about that. And I think there is an inherent danger uh, of becoming the holier-than-thou club, and that is not at all the point of sanctification. And this is why I think holiness needs to be pursued communally and not just individually. Because if we forget our neighbor along the way, we're missing something. Uh, St. Augustine says that everyone's born in the sinful condition with a bent back, in curvatus in se, and God works in us to heal that back problem. So eventually we're able to see others and then eventually we're able to see God. But if we go like this and I'm going to be holy, I'm going to be holy, I'm going to be holy, there's something missing. And so that's why I, <laughs> that's why oftentimes I'm not always the biggest fan of especially very strict monasticism or where you really isolate yourself. I'm not saying that there hasn't been people that have done that successfully, but I think by and large, uh, it's very hard to do that and also live as God called us to live. <laughs>